It's been a long time since I've done a YouTube presentation, so I wanted to recap. What I'm going to talk about today is life as a free man. Now, I consider myself a free man, but you know, I'll describe some of the things that I've found out in my journey to becoming a free man. And whether I actually am a free man or not. The first thing I want to discuss is the agreement. The agreement you have is an understanding and a comprehension that you are involved in a community, right? You live with other men and women. And although you have, you know, other life forms you come in contact with, your main issues in life are always going to be with other men and women. And when I say, from now on, when I say the word man or men, I'm including women. And what I mean by man is a man or woman who is over the age of 18 and competent to take care of their own affairs. Because that is who we deal with for the large, to the large extent. So in any confrontation you're going to have between another between yourself and another man, another human being would be that you know either you have engaged in a contract with them like you ordered dinner or you had the neighborhood boy cut your lawn or you have the plumber come over and fix your plumbing situation. It's a contract. And pretty much everybody doesn't get involved in disputes over their contracts. Once in a while, there's a dispute. You know, I thought I was going to get this color when I painted my house, and I didn't get what I wanted. But for the large uh, part of most people's lives, the interactions they're going to have are with government agents. You're going to get traffic tickets far and, and not like them far more often than you're going to get into a dispute with your neighbor. If the neighbor's dog is barking, you're not going to like that. But, you know, we learn to live with um, minor irritations in our life. So, whenever you are going to interact with government agents, then the thing to recognize in any dispute you're going to have is that there's three parts of that dispute, three separate things that are required to engage in a dispute. First, there's going to be you, the man, Second, there's going to be another man who's making a claim against you or who you are making a claim against. And thirdly, there has to be some kind of agreement that's in play. Otherwise, what do you have to do with that person? You know, what is that man to you? Right? You either have a contract you can bring forward and say, look, we agreed that you were going to put in copper pipe into my from the street into my house and I film I took pictures of it and you put plastic pipe in I'm not happy I want you to redo it or if the policeman pulls you over I'm sorry is there a contract you're operating under that allows you to do what you're doing because we all know it's a known duty and obligation that you don't touch another man, you don't stop another man, if the other man wants to continue walking down the street and you lay your hands on him, you're in trouble, right? So what gives the policeman the right to do it? Uh, because that's the way it is. There has to be some kind of contractual agreement that you are a party to, that you agree to, because if you don't agree to it, there's a dispute. Now, there has to be an agreement, and if there is no agreement, then the other man is operating outside of the law. If you go and force your will on the man walking down the street in front of your house and say that, let's say, I'm going to pass Andy's law, and I'm going to say I'm Andy. I'm going to pass Andy's law, and Andy's law is that anybody walking in front of my house owes me a fee of $10, and I'm going to go out there and collect it at gunpoint. Is that possible? Do I have any authority to do that? No, because there's actually no agreement with the rest of the community that they'll abide by Andy's law. And I would, and I would have to publish Andy's law, make everybody aware of Andy's law, and then everybody would have to agree to Andy's law. Otherwise, I really don't have any right to do that. 
And Fred, who lives across the street, passes Fred's law. And every time I walk in front of Fred's house, you know, he can charge me a fee. If he publishes it and I know about it, does that mean I'm subject to it? So those three things have to exist. You, me, and the agreement between us that we both agree upon. And then what's the authority of you? What's the authority of me? And what's the authority of the agreement? Because if, it, if I don't have any authority to make a claim on you, then my claim is void and it becomes a fraud, basically. If I say you owe me something, that you are liable to pay this fee or to, to go to jail or to give me your property, whatever that property is. If I tell you that you are liable and you have to give me these things and you say, I'm sorry, I don't have to do that. You don't have any authority to make me do that. Then the burden of proof, the burden of proof is on the party making the claim. So if you dispute that there is any authority, then the burden of proof is on the party making the claim to come forward and show what facts they are relying on, as Mark Stevens would say. What facts are you relying on that I'm liable for this? And it's like, buh, 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 buh. They can't come out with any facts. Or they come out with um, smoke and mirrors, right? Something that you don't have any you know, relation to you never sign an agreement to. So that's number one, the agreement. And if you don't have those three elements in the agreement and there's no authority for the agreement, then there is no agreement. Number two, the next thing I want to talk about is fictions. And to me, fictions are an extremely important part of this discussion because fictions, once you go into the world of fictions, you're going into make-believe land. All governments are fictions. All trusts are fictions. All corporations are fictions. Limited liability companies are fictions. Foundations are fictions. Fictions are things that don't exist, that aren't real. Now, when we look up the word real, in my mind, the word real is something I can perceive with my senses. I can see it, hear it, touch it, smell it, feel it with my fingers. If I can perceive something with my senses, then it's real. Now, I could be psychotic and be suffering from psychosis where I see things that are imaginary and aren't real. There's no reality to my experience. So the second part of being able to see it and hear it and smell it and feel it is that everyone else can do the same. There is a general agreement. Ten people are standing there and they saw Bob go over and hit Larry with a baseball bat. They actually saw it. They heard it. And they can all testify to the same event happening. Okay, pretty much guaranteed that was real. What does the Bible say? You know, two or more people are necessary to establish a fact. So, if you have two people that see the same thing, I mean, they can be lying, of course, but it's going to be assumed that they're honorable people and they're telling the truth, and that establishes a fact. What if you're the only one that can see something and nobody else can see it? You're schizophrenic, right? You're, you are suffering from psychosis. United States of America is a fictional thing. It doesn't exist. And I know I can prove it doesn't exist because nobody will ever give me the name and address to send a subpoena to for the United States of America to come and testify in court. And if you can't testify in court for 12 people to witness the testimony, all 12 people hear that testimony and they agree that they heard that testimony, that makes it real. But if that party never comes forward to testify, then they don't exist. If they can't be brought into court, they don't exist. Anything that's real can be brought into court. Well, the wind is real. People hear it, and they recognize what the wind is, but you can't 
order it to come to court. But you can bring a rock to court, you can bring a gun to court as evidence, you can bring anything that can be held in the court, you know, and it becomes something that everybody can witness. And if they all agree that what they saw was a large rock, then that's a fact. So, you know, the state of California simply does not exist. And what you have is a conspiracy by all uh, government agents to engage in criminal activity by claiming the right to take other people's property and not because they said so, right? You'll never find ever a government agent that says, I have the right to take your property. No, they'll say, the state of California has a law and you have to ab abide by the law, so we're taking your property. But the we they're talking about is men and women, right? I mean, only men and women can act in this world. Only a man or woman can take your property. Only a man and woman can interact with you, can speak to you, can file paperwork against you, can sign their name to something. Fictional things can't do that. So, and imagine if I said, look, my imaginary friend here, only I'm not going to say imaginary friend here, my friend here, Bob, says you owe him money. And I'm, I'm not enforcing my will on you, I'm enforcing Bob's rights. You're going to go, I never signed any agreement with Bob, and I don't have any agreement with Bob. And, you know, I'm not going to give Bob anything because Bob is, not, is just your alter ego. That's what it comes down to. Me trying to take your property on Bob's behalf, my imaginary friend. Now let's just change the name Bob to the state of California. I'm Bob and I'm trying to take your property and it's not me that's trying to take your property, it's the state of California taking your property. No, Bob, it's you taking my property because without you and your order, no property will be taken. Isn't that true? Yeah. Okay then. So the state of California, I deny that the state of California exists. And I declare you cannot provide me any factual evidence that the state of California is real. To fictitious plaintiff. A person appearing in the writ or record as the plaintiff in a suit, but who in reality does not exist, or who is ignorant of the suit or of the uses of, of his name in it. It is a contempt of court to sue in the name of a, of a fictitious party. Let's read that again. It is a contempt of court to sue in the name of a fictitious party. So, I mean, how many lawsuits in America today are really the attorney is guilty of uh, contempt of court for suing the name of a corporation which is fictitious? Fictitious founded on a fiction, having the character of a fiction, pretended, counterfeit, people versus Carmona, feigned, imaginary, not real, false, not genuine, non-existent. So you're making a claim for your imaginary friend and you're the one who's going to benefit from it because the property is real. I'm real, you're real, and you're going to transfer the ownership of the property from me to you and claim that you have a right to do so because your imaginary friend said it's okay. So, it's a, to me, it's a huge deal to recognize the fact that fictions don't exist and that people hide behind them and pretend that they do. A fictional entity claiming that they own your house. Bank of America says it owns your house, so I'm sorry. Um, you, you're claiming that I entered into an agreement to borrow money from the Bank of America. That's right. Okay, I'm denying that the Bank of America exists. And things that are imaginary can't loan money. They can't go to work. They can't acquire money. They can't sign agreements. Oh no, they didn't sign the agreement somebody else made the offer and you accepted. 
Well, yeah, okay, a man made the offer, so he was loaning me his money. No, he wasn't loaning you his money, he was loaning you Bank of America's money. Okay, let's go round and round. You're claiming that Bank of America has money, but you can't, you can't produce Bank of America. You are the agent of Bank of America. And as the agent of Bank of America, the whole purpose of creating corporations is limiting the liability of the man who works for it. Let's look at <clears throat> um, the UCC 3-402. Or the agent cannot be held liable when acting for the principal. If he has anything on the paperwork that he signed that says he's an agent, then he's not liable. Oh, so all I have to do is sign everything as agent, and you can't, you can't, if I sign the ticket as agent, does that relieve me of any liability? Under UCC it does. <laughs> right? And then the policeman will say, well, um, no, you can't sign agent. You have to sign as the party I'm making the ticket out to. Well, well, I'm signing as agent. I'm going to have to take you to jail then, see? The point is this. You go in front of the judge, the judge says, prove that you're an agent of the party that the ticket was given to. How are you an agent? I don't have to answer that any more than the agent of Bank of America has to answer that or the government agent has to answer that. If the, if you, are you claiming you as a judge are an agent of the state of California? Prove it. When did you get hired by the state of California? Have you ever met the state of California? When did the state of California tell you what you could and couldn't do as a judge? See, you're telling me your imaginary friend, the state of California, gave you power. That's like me saying, my imaginary friend over here is giving me power. Until we get it through our heads that fictional entities don't exist and have no authority, you can't engage. It's an impossibility to engage in a contract with a, with a fictional entity. It's an impossibility for a fictional entity to act in this world. It's an inf impossibility for a fictional entity, an imaginary party, to have rights. Imaginary parties don't have rights. Otherwise, you know what? Here, look, my friend Bob here has rights, and you violated Bob's rights. I'm not saying you violated mine. I'm saying you violated his. And if, I can, and if you ask me to produce actual evidence that he exists and I can't, what does that make me? guilty of fraud because I'm trying to take property based on a lie, based on a fraud. So, you know, if the whole country is brainwashed into seeing that the emperor has clothes when he's naked, then that is just an example of how complete the brainwashing is. But once you really see fictions, they are everywhere. The only true purpose of a fiction, the legitimate purpose of a fiction, is a trust. A trust is a fictional thing also. And the, what a trust is, is a trust is a way of transferring or holding property. The grantor is the party that has the property, and he is giving the property into the trust, and the property is, after it's put into the trust, it's put into the trust for the benefit of another. And that other is the beneficiary. So you have grantor, beneficiary. Now whose job is it to make sure that the beneficiary gets the use of that property or gets what they're entitled to? That is the trustee. All three have to be living things. You can't have fictions. The trust is the fiction, but the three parties involved have to be real. Now, they're going to say, some trust law says that a trustee can be a trust. That's not possible. Trusts can't act. So a trustee has to execute the trust. What is the trust? The fourth element of a trust that has to be present is the, is the contractual agreement called the indenture. The indenture is the written trust that has to be executed. It defines whose property it belongs to, the grantor, whose property it's being transferred to, the beneficiary, how it's being transferred, when it's being transferred, by who it's being transferred, you know, the duties of the trustee, 
And if the beneficiary is aware of the trust, then the beneficiary can go enforce the trust by forcing the trustee to execute the trust. <clears throat> if the trustee fails to execute the trust or keeps property for himself or doesn't do what the trust says, then he can go to prison. The trustee has to sign the agreement that he's going to act as trustee and the trust and nobody is, can work for free. So if somebody tells you that you're the trustee of an account, when do you ever get paid for that? If you have to perform work and you don't get paid, you know what we call that? Involuntary servitude. That's the definition of involuntary servitude. And involuntary servitude is prohibited. Can't, you can't force that on somebody. So if you're going to be trustee and you have obligations to engage in executing a trust, you get paid for that and the indenture should outline what the payment should be. The trustee can't just make up anything he wants. The indenture is the written out trust and it tells exactly what the trust is going to do. So Woodrow Wilson, who was the president who made the Federal Reserve become a real part of our lives in 1913, wrote a paper on why uh, trusts were so superior to corporations because in a trust the trustee who's executing that trust can go to jail in a corporation everybody wants to have limited liability the true purpose of a corporation is to acquire wealth distribute it to those that control it and to have those that control it be able to collect the money without being liable once again we go into the fact that the agent can't be sent to prison for the acts of the principal. And if they're going to say the principal is, let's say, um, American Airlines, and American Airlines on the order of the CEO cuts back on servicing their airplanes, and people die, and it's found out that, that um, they decided to skimp on doing the repairs to their airlines, and because of that they have airline crashes at a more frequent rate than they used to, then they can be sued. Can you send American Airlines to prison? Can they go to jail? Can they sit in the electric chair? No, because imaginary parties can't go to jail. And the president, the CEO, the one who actually acts and makes the uh, mechanics stop working on the airplanes, he's the one who's responsible. And they're going to, of course, bring that out, but he's going to say, you know, you can't send me to prison for my actions. I'm only acting as an agent for the corporation. And the benefit beneficiaries of the corporation are all the shareholders, when in truth, the real beneficiaries are the CEO who charges outrageous fees, and his fees go up according to how much money the corporation makes. So he's got a vested interest in it, and he's benefiting or losing out on depending, depending on his decisions. But he's the one responsible. The shareholders didn't say stop servicing the airplane. They were never given a vote. It's only his directive. So you see the purpose of a corporation is to get out of being responsible. Knowing that, how about all the children get together and form corporations and say, you know what, I know I took you know, Jimmy's toys, and, you know, if I get caught stealing Jimmy's toys, or if I get caught lying to you, then I'm in trouble. But I'm just going to form a corporation and say that I'm only acting as an agent for my alter ego here. So even though I did the deed, I shouldn't be spanked. <laughs> you know, that is the point that corporations would like everybody to believe that they have a right to do. So start thinking about it this way. If you got a loan from Bank of America, Bank of America is going to come along and say, the bar association who set this, um, a private organization, who set this stupid system up, you know, this imaginary world that, that they create, their whole point is that we can say that we're not responsible, we're not liable, right? So. The Bank of America says, you know, we loaned you money. Bank of America loaned you money. That's a lie. Bank of America doesn't exist. 
Bank of America never loaned any money. So the only party that can actually say they loaned you money would be Bob, who sat down and, you know, when you came in for a loan application, you submitted it to Bob and Bob approved it, which means Bob is loaning you money. But Bob will never come forward and say, you owe me money. Where'd you get the money to loan, Bob? Bob's never going to be able to explain where he got the money to loan and uh, he was loaning you the money because that would be fraud. I mean, on so many levels, right? It's not your money, Bob. And you didn't actually give me any money. So the point is, is that when you, when you go to court, you will never find Bank of America coming in to speak. You'll say, I, you know, I work for Bank of America. That's a lie. Because if you never met Bank of America and Bank of America didn't hire you and Bank of America didn't tell you what it wanted you to do, then you don't work for Bank of America. You work for your superior. And then if your superior gets subpoenaed and come in, he's going to say he works for his superior. And it's going to go all the way to the top, the CEO, the chief executive officer. And executive branch officers execute. They act. Okay? So... The chief executive officer is the one who's the one, is, is the responsible party. And yet, if he says that he never met the corporation, Bank of America, then he's committing a fraud by saying that you owe Bank of America money because he has no factual evidence of that. And he's putting some, a statement forward that he knows, you know, it's willful and knowingly entering false information into a public record. What's the public record? The county recorder's office where he claims that the Bank of America is the owner, the lien holder. That's a lie. No judge will ever allow you to present this information and rule correctly on it because he's a co-conspirator in the lie. He knows it's true, but he's not going to allow that to come out. So the purpose of fictions is to limit the liability of men. And you only deal with men. You don't deal with fictions. You've never seen a fiction, ever. So the true purpose of a fiction would be a trust, and that would be to hold public property for the public's use. If I want to drive on the public right-of-way and, and travel down to San Francisco then guess what? I have a right to use the public right-of-way. I am a part owner of that. The trust has kept all public property for the use of the beneficiaries, and I'm one of the beneficiaries. Think about that for a minute. Who owns the, the highway? Not the state of California. That's a fiction. The state of California does not own that highway. It's the public that owns the highway. I'm a part owner. Can I be trespassing on my own property? That's an impossibility. I cannot be trespassing on my property. If you didn't have a trust holding that property, then what? You know, you can make an argument that the creator of a thing is the owner of that thing. It's true. If I go out to the wood shop and create a chair and make a chair with my own wood, I'm the owner. Can I burn it? Can I put it in the garbage? Can I destroy it? Can I sell it? Can I do whatever I want with that property? Yep, it's my property. I created it. So who created the public right-of-way? Who created the earth? Well, you're not going to find anybody who doesn't believe that God created the earth or nature or whatever supreme power that you want to envision that made this universe spring into existence because we know damn well no man did it. Whoever made this earth spring into existence is the creator of that. We also understand that I am a creation of God. Every man, every dog, every rock, everything that's real is a creation of God. So if you're going to deny me the right to walk on my father's property, you're going to have a hard time explaining that one. You bought the property from who? Unless you've got a deed and a bill of sale from God, then that property was stolen from its rightful owner, God. 
and you're making a claim that's fraudulent. There are, you know, communities that have lived like that, you know, the Hawaiians, the American Indians, Aboriginal tribes. They believed that God owned the property. And if you were, um, you had the right to live, you have the right to hunt the property and fish the property, but you don't have a right to say some other man can't step on your property. You have the right to say another man can't come into my tent. <laughs> you know, you have those rights. You have the right to make a garden and keep other people from taking the stuff in your garden. But you can only manage a certain amount of land. I tried farming once and for a couple of years. I found that an acre of land was way more land than I could tend to. So, the whole point is this. You can't really claim that the land is yours. But let's say we go into English common law where it's all about property rights and you say you do own the property. Still, you have a right to use your property and the public property is belongs to the public. It does not belong to a fictional thing like a state. If you go into a publicly owned DMV office, they can't kick you out for trespassing. It's yours. Yet you'll find agents who are, who are suffering psychosis saying that it belongs to the state, it belongs to the city, when it doesn't, because fictional things can't own things. They can hold that property for the beneficiary, and I'm the beneficiary, and you're the beneficiary. So... The next thing I would like to discuss is a contract, because I think that understanding what a contract is, is extremely val valuable. An agreement between two or more parties, preliminary step in making of which is offer by one and acceptance by the other, in which minds of the parties meet and concur in understanding of terms. And then in a, it's an agreement creating obligation in which there must be competent parties, subject matter, legal consideration, mutuality of agreement, and mutuality of obligation. And the agreement must not be so vague or uncertain that, that terms are not ascertainable. There's a maxim of law that says, the contract makes the law. And that is a given if you consider the fact that when you voluntarily enter into a contract, you are making an agreement with another man and fictional entities aren't competent. Competent means they can act, they can, perf they can have a meeting of the minds, full disclosure, and understand what the terms of the contract are. How can a fictional entity that doesn't exist understand the terms of the contract? There can't be any meetings of the mind because there's no mind to meet with. Second of all, how can there be an offer if one party it doesn't have a mouth, doesn't have any way of writing a contract, doesn't have any way of expressing that they're offering anything, and at the same time doesn't have any way of expressing that they accepted the contract. So you cannot have a contract with fictional things. That voids just about all of the contracts that they can say get you in trouble. Oh, you have a credit card contract. You have a credit card contract with Capital One? Really? Let Capital One come forward and claim, when did this contract occur? All they have is an application for credit. That's not a contract. They give you an application for credit, and then they start giving you credit. But the Capital One didn't give you anything because they don't exist. So there is no contract there. Is your driver's license a contract with the state of California? Not if the state of California doesn't exist. Where's the two parties that signed it? Where's the, what's the obligation that another man is going to do anything there? And who did you make this contract with? George Valverde, the head of the DMV? No, his name isn't anywhere on there. And what's his obligation? What, what valuable consideration did he give you? right? The right to 
um, go on the, on your own property, the public right of way, without being molested by law enforcement officers who aren't really officers at all. And when I say they're not really officers at all, what I mean by that is consider this for a moment. An officer is somebody who holds an office. All offices are elected. And you know damn well the CHP or the city police <clears throat> or any the, even the sheriff's deputies were never elected. Now, the sheriff's deputies have the best claim to write in that regard because the sheriff is an elected executive branch officer. And he actually does an appointment to the deputy. Now, can the deputy appoint somebody else? The city police aren't police at all. The chief of police of every city is, an, is a legislative branch officer, not an executive branch officer, because they are, they are hired by the city council, which is the legislative branch of government. They're not elected as chief of police of executive branch. They're not independent of the legislature. The legislative branch of the city funds the police department. So they control the police department, and every police officer for a city is a legislative branch officer and not an executive branch officer. Wow. The city isn't even a form of government, because in order to be a form of legitimate form of government, there have to be three branches, right? There has to be a legislative branch, an executive branch, and a judicial branch. But wait a minute. State of California claims it has those three things. United States of America claims it has those three things. The city does not. It's a municipal corporation. That's all. So if you're a municipal corporation, what right do you have to enforce your will on anybody other than municipal corporation-owned property? And being that the municipal or, uh, organization of the city of San Francisco can't really own property, then the whole idea that they can pass a law to anybody is ridiculous. But we live, we live in a state of insanity today where insane things happen on a constant basis, especially concerning the government. So the next thing I would like to discuss would be language. Language is of supreme importance when you're dealing with other men and women because if you don't know the terms they're using, then they can deceive you with their words. There has to be an agreement that the, that the language is going to be defined someplace so that we can all know what you're saying when you say it. And if you look up words in Webster's Dictionary and you, and you say that every legislated act conforms to the definition in Webster's Dictionary, even the dictionary is a fraud because how can you have one word that means four or five different things? How do I know what, what you meant when you used that word? See? David Wynn Miller does an interesting um, take on that. You know, does... I can prove that the words coming out of your mouth are vague and ambiguous. And we all know that any law that's vague and ambiguous, that means there can't be one single interpretation that's true that everybody recognizes, is void. So, or does 2 plus 2 equal 4? Does 2 plus 2 equal 4? How do you answer that? Yes? Okay. That's, that's true if it's numbers I'm talking about. But I didn't say numbers. I said T-O-O -O plus T-O equals F-O-U-R. See, that's not true. T-O-O -O is 2, and T-O is 2, but it doesn't equal 4. So now you've got two different answers for the same question because verbally and auditorily it's it's vague and ambiguous so words have to mean one specific thing and this is where 
why does a, a, a law that's passed, public law, become a statute, becomes a code? Why does the code allow for using its own definitions? See, that's right, that right there is shaky. I don't have to read all of your custom definitions to understand what you're saying because it's too much work. You should make it so clear that anybody reading it understands what you mean. And if you can't make it clear enough for other people to understand, there's no contract, right? There's no meeting of the minds. There's no full disclosure. The contract's vague and ambiguous. And there's no contract unless I accept it. So then you get into the Bar Association, which has no legitimate right to invade the justice system, and yet the Bar Association, a private corporation, has total control over the court system. No one is allowed to speak unless they've passed the bar for somebody else. And yet we see that you have a right to counsel, and nowhere, anywhere, does it say in the Constitution... It says you have a right to counsel, and it doesn't say you have a right to an attorney, and they knew what the word attorney was in, 17, in 1787 when they wrote the Constitution. Here's the First Congress, Session 1, Chapter 20, 1789, just after the Constitution was written. Section 34, and be it further enacted that the laws of the several states, except where the Constitution, treaties, or statutes of the United States shall otherwise require or provide, shall be regarded as the rules of decision in trials at common law. So, you know, the only time they're going to mention anything, it's common law, because that's what all the trials were guided under. Section 35, and be it further enacted that in all the courts of the United States, the parties may plead and manage their own causes personally or by the assistance of such counsel or attorneys at law. So the fact that you have the or in there, they know the difference between counsel and attorneys. They knew what an attorney was. They didn't say you have a right to an attorney. They, have a, they said you have a right to counsel. And the Bar Association had twisted that into you must have an attorney if they're going to speak for you. That's a lie. It's a fraud. There's no law that requires that. Then they change the language around to mean things that you don't understand and know. So when you go to court, you basically need to have an interpreter. But I'm going to stop talking about language now and move on to the Constitution. Between you and another man, if the other man is an agent of government, the only lawful authority he can possibly cite as the holy grail of where his authority comes from is the Constitution. If he's not going to cite the Constitution as his authority, then he's an outlaw because the Constitution says in it that it's the supreme law of the land. And in it, he has to have an oath of office to this Constitution in order to claim that he is an agent of government. It doesn't matter which branch of government he works for, legislative, judicial, or executive branch. All of them are required to take an oath of office to the U.S. Constitution and to their state constitutions. And each state government employee is required to do the same. It says so right in the U.S. Constitution. So the Constitution, being the supreme law of the land, is the only thing that, he, that any government agent can cite as their authority. And if they're going to go outside the Constitution, then they are an outlaw. You either follow the law or you're an outlaw, right? If you're going to lay in wait for somebody and take their property at gunpoint, you're a highwayman, you're a pirate, you're a thief, you're whatever you want to call it, but you're not a legitimate authorized representative of a government. And I know this because the only true purpose of government is to secure my rights, not to steal from me, and it can't take my property. It can only secure my rights. That's what its purpose is. Okay, Title 18, 
Section 2383, Rebellion or Insurrection. Whoever incites, sets on foot, assists, or engages in any rebellion or insurrection against the authority of the United States or the laws thereof. I mean, what could be better than the Constitution, which is the supreme law of the United States? And so if you're going to be in rebellion against that law, or gives aid and comfort to anybody who's in rebellion of, against the Constitution, shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than 10 years or both, and shall be incapable of holding any office under the United States. That's a presumption that you're already in office because, I mean, really, somebody that's going to war with the United States, hey, you know what, I've, I've decided to run for president in addition to that. And who formed the government? How did the government form? How did the federal government form? It was formed on the auspices of the, const the limitations that are set forth in the Constitution. So the Constitution formed the government. And who formed the Constitution? The people, allegedly. I mean, actually, it was a small group that got together and did it in secret and didn't allow anybody in that group to reveal any of what went on until the last one was dead. Mark Stevens said that. But anyway, the Constitution allegedly is, is created by the people, and the people create the Constitution, the Constitution creates the government. So, Justice Marshall said treason is usurping jurisdiction, or not taking jurisdiction where, when it's required. So what's jurisdiction? Jurisdiction. Think about the word. Jur, which means law. Diction is spoken. Spoken law. Bill Thornton did a long paper on how the word jurisdiction came from feudal times. As in, you're a serf and you live on a nobleman's property. And the nobleman has a castle. And he's going to take all of his people in and protect them from bands of outlaws roaming through the countryside. So in exchange for the protection that the nobleman's offering, you are going to swear an oath to the nobleman and pledge. That spoken pledge became jurisdiction. Now, today, jurisdiction basically means control, the right to use physical violence to control another man. If you don't have jurisdiction, you don't have that right. And that means that if you don't have jurisdiction, you're an outlaw, right? You're a thief, you're a pirate, you're a highwayman, if you don't have jurisdiction. You'll find that most law enforcement officers feel that they have jurisdiction to enforce the laws of the state, laws of this state or whatever state or commonwealth you live in. They have jurisdiction to enforce them in that state, but they know that if they go to another state, they can't arrest somebody. They don't have jurisdiction. So what's jurisdiction? The right to control somebody, you know, with the gun on your side, giving you absolute power over another man. And jurisdiction is a requirement of living in a community. There are times when jurisdiction is lawful, and there are times when it's unlawful. So, if somebody harms you, you have a right to complain and put a claim in against that other man who wronged you, and that you are, you have that man's wrong against you has created the jurisdiction for you to control him and force him to answer to your claim. So the Constitution is mandatory and prohibitory on the parties that work as government agents. It's the fence around the crop. It's designed to keep government agents in check. Okay, the question is not what power the federal government ought to have, but what powers in fact have been given by the people. Okay, who are we recognizing as the ultimate authority of the government? The people! It hardly seems necessary to reiterate that ours is a dual form of government, and in every state there are two governments, the state and the United States. 
Each state has all governmental power, save such as the people by their constitution have conferred upon the United States, denied to the states, or reserved to themselves. The federal government is a government of delegated powers. Federal government is a government of delegated powers. It has only such as are expressly conferred upon it and such as are reasonably to be implied from those granted. In this respect, we differ radically from nations where all legislative power without restriction or limitation is vested in a parliament or other legislative body subject to no restrictions except the discretion of its members. And that's from the Supreme Court, United States versus Butler, 297 U.S. 1 in 1936. Delegatus non potest delegare. A delegate cannot delegate. An agent cannot delegate his functions to a sub-agent without the knowledge or consent of the principal. The person to whom an office or duty is delegated cannot lawfully devolve that duty on another unless he be expressly authorized to do so. Page 513, Black's Law 4th. So, if the people delegated authority to the federal government through a constitution, the principle is the people. So, that means Congress can't give something that it has a duty to do, like coin money, and give it to the Federal Reserve. That would be transferring a delegation of authority to somebody who's not authorized to have it. The same with declaring war. You can't give KBR the right to declare war. Only Congress can declare war. So everything that the Constitution is, is, is delegated power from the people. And unless they came back to the people and asked if they could do something, they don't have it if it's not there. It's not designed to keep you, the man who's sovereign, in check. Uh-uh. The purpose of government is secure is to secure your rights, and the Constitution notes what some of your rights are. But it doesn't say that your rights come from the Constitution. That would be ridiculous. Your rights come from God. The people created the Constitution, so the, the, the rights that are outlined in the Constitution came from the people that created it, but they certainly didn't come from the Constitution. Your rights don't come from the government. Your rights don't come from another man. You know, when we had a king, the king could claim that you're his subject and that he, or, he was the one that was superior to you. But now that every man is equal, my rights don't come from my equal. They don't come from my equal. They come from me. They come from God. So the only laws that I consider are worthy of following, that I follow, and after researching this and thinking about it a lot, I came up with four laws that are undeniable, that are duties and obligations of myself and every other man. And that is, one, I can't physically harm my fellow man. I can't hit them. I can't touch them. I cannot physically harm him and trespass on his rights. Number two, I can't take another man's property. If it's not my property, I have no right to take it. I can't claim it's my right to take it. It's not my property. I know it's not my property. I'm not claiming it's my property. So if I take another man's property, I'm a thief. That's a law that's universal. Three, I can't bear false witness. I can't commit fraud. I can't financially gain or make a financial detriment to my fellow man through some kind of false statement. I can't say some other man did something to another man that would be false, right? That'd be bearing false witness to an event. I can't do that without being punished for it. And the punishment should be that I am physically forced to come to court and answer to those things that somebody else will have acquired jurisdiction over me if they swear a claim that I violated these laws. And the fourth element of law would be 
that if I voluntarily enter into a valid contract that I am obligated not to breach that contract. And if, and if somebody alleges that I've breached the contract, I can forcibly be hauled into court to answer to that. Those four things. That's it. Everybody knows these things. Everybody does. Everybody knows from the time they're a child they can't take something that's not theirs and they can't lie. Everybody has a known duty and obligation to do these things. So if a police officer impounds your car, he doesn't have any right to do that. If uh, they take money out of your bank account, that's theft. It's not their property. So if you can't show under the Constitution, if I can show under the Constitution that you have an oath of office and that you violated it, you've committed treason, basically. I want to know how you can become a government employee and not take a test on the Constitution to prove that you have an understanding of that Constitution before you can accept a position working for the government. Because that way it would instill knowledge of the Constitution in those public servants and they would know that they couldn't violate that. And if they did violate it, they're going to prison. But instead, the elite powers don't want them to know that they are limited by the Constitution and that the only authority they have comes from the Constitution and therefore you know, they're going to act unconstitutionally, and as long as they don't see anybody else being punished for it, they're going to continue doing it. So this was section one. In section two, I'm going to discuss law and courts and how to proceed in courts. Thank you for watching.